You know, some folks had mentioned something about topical messages. We did that during Christmas. We preached Christmas messages, but I like preaching verse by verse. And the reason why I like preaching verse by verse is there's a less likely chance you're going to take things out of context. And guess what? When you're preaching verse by verse, you're also preaching topically because different topics come up within the passages of Scripture. Amen? And so this morning, we're going to preach on teaching. Amen? A challenge to our teachers uh, this morning is what we're going to be preaching on. And so uh, I just want to say this before we get started, that uh, I thank you for your prayers while we were out. Uh, I don't know what we had, but we we're back. Uh, we don't know if it was a cold, flu, or whatever it was. But uh, just know that as a church, we are praying for our family members. We are taking precautions as well. Uh, I will have a printout sheet uh, out on that table in the foyer for you to show you the protocols we're following. What we're doing is we're asking you to sit together by family. I know we're missing quite a few uh, folks today, uh, but we're just asking if you feel ill, if you feel sick, just stay home. And when you feel better, come back. That means don't stay home. Amen. Come back. Amen. And so uh, the good thing is what's going on now is not very, not as dangerous as before. And so we don't want to undermine it. Right. But we also don't want to be so overly cautious where we are not meeting together. It's much needful that we meet together. Uh, our spiritual needs are greater than any other need right now in our country. So we want to just make sure that we continue to be faithful uh, here in God's house. And uh, what are the greater place to be than here? Amen. I'm excited to be here. I hope you are too. Amen. All right. James chapter 3, a challenge to teachers this morning. And that's why I wanted to do that because uh, this is a challenge. It's a challenge to be a teacher. It's not something that we should take lightly. And James says that right here. So in James chapter 3, we're going to look at one verse. It says here, My brethren, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for the day. We thank you for uh, your word that was written for time for our learning. We thank you for its preservation, Lord, and its, uh, its consistency, uh, its truthfulness that converts the soul. We thank you so much that we can learn from the word of God how to be wiser in this world full of sin. And so, Lord, I pray that as we look at these scriptures this morning, that our, our teachers will be encouraged, but also I pray that the Christian overall will be strengthened and encouraged through the message this morning. And so we thank you for the word of God, that we can uh, teach it freely. We have a place of worship we can come to, and we just want to lift up Jesus Christ this morning, and thank you for all you do for us. And so as we look into your word, Lord, I pray you meet with us, speak to our hearts. Now, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so, as you know, if you've been over here for the last several uh, weeks, we've spent four months on two chapters in James, and so we've had much to talk about. And so we started out by James really giving us a proper perspective of how to deal with trials in life. How many of y'all agree that we're all going to go through trials at some point or another? Maybe some of you are going through some right now. And so James says it's needful that we understand what trials are all about. We talked about how uh, we need to be quick to hear God's word, amen, and, and his instruction, and how we need to be slow to speak and slow to anger. We talked about how uh, the sin of partiality is, is a sin. That's what it is. When we're prejudiced toward others, for maybe the way they may look or the way they may act, whatever the case may be. And so James spent half of chapter 2 talking about that. We spent the other half of chapter 2 talking about what true faith is, that how faith should be evident in our lives if we're, if we're Christians. Uh, recently, we just talked about Rahab, the prostitute, and Abraham, the father of, our, our, of all Christians. Amen? And so we spent time with that. And so James now deals with what we call sins and challenges of the tongue. I don't know about you, but I don't know, no matter how old or young you might be, the tongue is a challenge. Would you agree? Uh, oftentimes we say things that we regret, that we would like to take back, and unfortunately we can't. And so James deals with that here. And so when James is addressing teachers here, he's not just talking to uh, preachers or pastors who preach to a congregation. He's really talking about anybody who would stand up and teach the Word of God. And so let's go ahead and look at the, the text here and see what James wants us to learn concerning teachers. So first of all, we see here, we see the opportunity of teachers. He says in James 3 verse 1, he says, my brethren, be not many masters or teachers. This word master here means one who teaches concerning the things of God and the duties of man, one who is fitted to teach or thinks himself so. Uh, I think about the 25 years that I've been in ministry, and I, I was kind of doing like an uh, uh, estimate of how many people probably I've spoken to or how many messages I've preached, and I think I've preached almost 4,000 messages 
over those 25 years. And so this does not include special occasions like funerals and weddings and uh, youth camps and mission trips and marriage seminars and all the other things where there's a lot of people gathered all at one time. And I thought about that. Wow, that's a tremendous opportunity, is it not? For most of my uh, pastoral uh, ministry, I've been what we call bivocational. I spent many years as a physics and biology teacher, uh, having an opportunity to teach kids, and also as a counselor for many years. And, and I was calculating the other day that I've had about 30,000 teaching opportunities with about 10,000 students. And there, oftentimes I'll run into some of these kids in the community they will come to me and say, hey, I remember when you taught me this about God. And I'm thinking, I did? I don't even remember, amen. But you know what? They remember. Because it's a tremendous opportunity, is it not? And so teachers have that tremendous opportunity to impact others by what they say, but also by what they do. Now, the Greek word translated teachers here is a very general word. It actually applies to the rabbis who taught in the synagogues in that day. It was also the most frequent title given to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was referred to as a teacher or rabbi over 60 times. As a matter of fact, we find that as Jesus was involved in ministry those three and a half years, he taught small crowds, he taught large crowds, he even taught individuals, he taught on mountaintops, amen, mountainsides, he taught uh, in valleys, he taught in synagogues and temples, and one time he even taught from a boat. How would you like that, amen? And so Jesus here we see in John 13, verse 13, even refers to himself as a teacher. He says here, ye call me master or teacher and Lord and say well, for so I am. Uh, one day he ran into Nicodemus. He was a religious ruler of the Jews. He was a teacher himself of the Jewish people. And it says here in John 3, 1, he said there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler or teacher of the Jews, a master teacher actually. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. And so Jesus was one of the greatest teachers ever known to man. Amen? But yet he never entered a classroom. He never had a degree. But yet the whole world was his classroom. Was it not? And so again, when James is not talking about pastors who preach to their congregations, this applies to anyone who teaches the Bible. Sunday school teachers. Children's church small group studies, neighborhood Bible clubs, knocking on doors, mission trips, whatever it might be, it applies to anyone who teaches the Bible. And so James 3, 1, he addresses the group here by two words. He says this, my brethren. James makes it clear that he's talking to the Christian, all Christians, amen? And only a true born-again believer can lead someone else to Christ or teach others about God. If person A is lost, he cannot lead person B to God, amen, or to the way to God. And so ultimately, this is to all Christians because all Christians are supposed to be teachers. Amen? We find the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verse 18. We know it all. I'll read the first part of it. But here we know that in this instant, it was presented to the disciples, but ultimately is for all of us. It says in Matthew 28, 18, we know this all too well, but it says here, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven, and in earth, and then look what he says here. He says, go ye, speaking of us, and teach all nations. Amen? And so we're all to be teachers here, we see very clearly. 2 Timothy 2, 24. And the servant of the Lord, as all of us, must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing or teaching those that oppose themselves. And then lastly, 1 Peter 3, 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and free uh, and fear. And so here we're to be ready always to give an answer, the Bible says here in the Bible. And so Christianity is what we call a teaching faith, amen? It is a laboring faith. It takes work. When we have these teachers come up here, man, they're putting in work. They're laboring for your children and for our community. And so we see a great example in Jesus in Matthew 9. Jesus himself saw the opportunity that he had as a teacher. Let's look at the life of Jesus here in Matthew 9 and then verse 35. Here we'll find that the Bible says in Matthew 9, 35, it says, And Jesus went about all the cities, I love that word all there, and villages. 
Now, what was Jesus doing? The Bible says right here that he was teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So what was Jesus doing? He was teaching. The Christian life of the Christian faith is a teaching faith. Amen? And he goes on and says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Now, this is not just sympathy. Oftentimes we get a... We, we get our heart aches for someone when we see them in a certain predicament, and we feel sorry for them. But this is much deeper than sympathy. This is empathy. It's putting yourself in that person's place, in their shoes, seeing it from their vantage point. And so Jesus saw these folks. The Bible says he was moved with compassion on them. Now, why was he moved with compassion? What did he see? Were they poor? Were they begging for food? No. It was spiritually. When you look at people, how, what do you see? Do you see the spiritual side of them? Did you, do you look at them and say, man, I wonder if they know Jesus? That's the way we should see people. We should, ask, we should wonder if every person that we meet, if they know Jesus. Amen. The Bible says here, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. And then this is the reason why, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. They had no church. They had no pastor. They had no truth. They didn't have a place like Trinity Baptist Church where they can come. You know, I, I, I read this the other day, but it said, uh, in the newspaper, we can find out all the problems that we have in the world, but in the Bible, we can find out the reasons why. They didn't know the why. They had questions. Why this and why that? But there were no answers. They had no shepherd. They had no church like this. They had no place they can come. So often we take the opportunity we have in a, in a place like this, on a, on a morning like this, for granted. We should never do that. Amen? And so Jesus had compassion. The Bible goes on and says, And then saith he unto his disciples, And I say the same unto you this morning, as followers of Christ, the harvest truly is plenteous, but guess what? The laborers, the workers are few. Who are those workers? That's you and I. He goes on and says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that ye, he will send forth laborers into his harvest. We have our neighborhood Bible club coming up pretty soon. And there's folks already signed up on the list. Amen. What a blessing. We try to provide an opportunity where everybody can come and serve. And so I want to pray. If you, even if you can't make it out every Saturday, come out and just observe. See what's going on. Pray. Amen. That the Lord will send forth laborers and pray that God will send people uh, to hear the truth as we do this and as we try to become a light to the community. And so there's a tremendous opportunity we have as Christians to be teachers. And then number two, we see the responsibility of teachers. Look at James 3 in verse 1 again. It says, be not many masters or teachers. Now, if I were to kind of change this around a little bit, what it's really saying is this. Not many should be teachers. That's what it's saying. Wow, why would James say that? Why would he say not many people should be teachers? Someone once said, if you can avoid being a preacher, by all means do it. <laughs> Anyone who stands up to preach puts himself in a fearful position, especially those who speak for God, which is what James is referring to here. I get asked quite often, hey, Pastor, when you, when you preach, do you get nervous? My knees are shaking right now. Hey, man. <laughs> it, it's more of, a, of, a, of a, uh, a nervous excitement, and it's usually right before I come up. But, yeah, I get nervous. And you know what? I hope that never changes. I hope that never changes because it's a serious thing. So what James is saying here, don't take it lightly. Or don't do it for selfish gains or selfish reasons. Amen. Because it is both a prestigious and a powerful position. It is a noble opportunity. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul advised some pastors and church leaders when it came to appointing those who would be teachers in the church. And the scripture says this. He says, lay hands suddenly on no man. We must not rush people into teaching positions. And I, and I know what you're thinking. Many churches are like this. We, we need more teachers. We're, we're desperate for help. And I get that. We really do. But in our haste to do the Lord's work, let's make sure that we don't disregard the Lord's command. Amen? Yes, we need teachers. And guess what? Newsflash, we will always need more teachers. Amen? That's the point I'm making this morning. But we never have enough. But don't let that be the need cause you to put someone in a teaching position who isn't qualified. 
That's very important. I, I, I know that before I, I started, uh, when I had already resigned from my other position at the other church, uh, I had peop- a person that contacted me. And he said, well, you know what? I have this degree and I've done this and I've been a teacher and I've, I love working with children. And he was pretty much saying that I would love to come over to your church and start teaching in the children's ministry. And I was kind of taken back at first. and I thought, I haven't even started yet. <laughs> Amen. But then I thought, you know what? I'd be more impressed if that person would have came to church, visited it for several weeks, saw if this is a place where his family could get fed and felt comfortable here and where they could serve. I'd be more impressed with that before that person The first thing they ask me is, I would love to come teach, right? And so James says, be careful. As a church, we got to be careful. They need to be vetted. They need to be checked out. We need to know a little bit more about them, their doctrine, what they believe. This is the foundation of our church, the fabric of everything that we do, amen? We need to observe their life. How do they treat other people? All these things are very important, and it's a mistake to rush anybody into a position of leadership, You see, we shouldn't do what we call a fast-track promotion just because we have an empty spot for a class. Someone once said this one time. He says, a man's gift will make room for him. That simply means that if a person has the ability and the desire to do so, God will make sure that it happens. Amen? You see, godliness will always show itself eventually, and so will a critical spirit and a hot temper, and unbelief. And so James says here, it's a very serious thing. You have leadership abilities and qualities, and be sure God has called you to do it. Because once you do it, you're responsible for everybody else that you teach. Amen? And it's a very noble thing, but it's a very daunting thing. And let me also say this, if you're not called to do it, then be content with what God's called you to. Be content with the gifts that God has given you. I'll tell you right now, I can't sing. Did you know that? Newsflash, amen. And I'm never going to be a good singer until I get my glorified body in heaven. I'm looking so forward to that, amen. And one day we'll all be great singers and all great teachers in heaven. But now be content with what God has placed you. Do not try to be what you are not. Because the Bible says here is to be regarded as the highest responsibility on earth. What if our teachers, and I'm sure they do, were to Look at the opportunity as a teacher to say, man, I'm doing the most prestigious thing that God could ever ask anybody to do, to have the opportunity to take the word of God and teach it to other people. It is the means in which God has chosen to translate men from darkness to light, from hell to heaven. It's a powerful thing. I love Romans 10, 13. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, what? Shall be saved. Well, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher or a teacher? That just reminds me how important it is as a teacher and what you're doing for the Lord. The Bible tells us the teaching of the cross and the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness, but to who are saved is the what? The power of God. Teaching is the power of God. Amen. And so James says, not many should be teachers. Well, I want to give you a few more reasons why. First of all, teaching, I said earlier, is a scary thing. It really is. Because the first thing we notice about teachers here in James is that they speak for God. You see, when you came to church this morning, you were expecting from me to expound on the Word of God. Amen? Amen? Because we know that people want and need the truth. They really do. No one cares about my opinions on politics or the weather, or the news. As a matter of fact, the weathermen get it wrong most of the time, hey man. I mean, the other day, it just rained out of nowhere. It wasn't on the forecast. And it didn't just rain for five or ten minutes either. So there you go. They didn't want to hear me discuss the economy of foreign policy. We have experts that do that, and they do a much better job than I would do. Let me just tell you, hey man. Someone said this. The best preachers are plagiarists. All they do is tell people what God has said, and I'm all for that type of plagiarism, amen? And that's really true. You see, when the pastor gives his text, the people expect him to explain what it means. Everything else is secondary to speaking the truth God has already spoken in his word. When the preacher does it well, when that preacher is faithful to what God has said, then we can truly say what 
the preacher says is what God says. And that's what I want Trinity Baptist Church to be about. I wanted to say that whatever the preacher says is what God says. We want to make sure that we're preaching according to the word of God. And let me just tell you something. It's an awesome privilege, but also it's a heavy obligation. It really is. And so it's a scary thing because we speak for God. Number two, teaching is a scary thing because you have to practice what you preach. How many say, man, that's a difficult one. Amen. Uh, we always throw that word out. Don't be a hypocrite, right? You know, I don't know about you, but if I'm listening to somebody who's talking about investments, I want to see their portfolio. Amen. Or if they're teaching me about flying an airplane, I want to know they can do it themselves. Or if they're preaching on prayer, I want to know what type of prayer life that they have. Or if they're speaking about giving sacrificially, I want to hear their testimony, how God has blessed them for their giving. You get what I'm saying? Now, I know when we talk about being a hypocrite that our ears go up. I know radar goes up. But let me tell you something. No one is perfect. Newsflash, right? I mean, we all stumble at times. But you know what? Integrity matters. Our testimony matters. I want to prove that to you. In 1 Timothy, in Titus chapter 1, Paul lists 25 character qualities of godly leaders. He mentions things like, uh, we should not love money, or, or, and also we should have self-control, how we should be able to rule over our home or guide our families, how we should have a personal testimony. He mentions all these things, and in all these 25 character qualities, he only mentions teaching one time. So what does that imply to you and I? That our character is what truly matters. Amen? A leader's life must be backed up with how he lives. Truth matters, but so does integrity. The world understands this more than we do. As a matter of fact, uh, what happens when a Christian messes up or a church leader messes up? What happens all over the front page of the news? Is it not? You know why? Because the world understands this more than we do sometimes, don't they? Now, we may say, oh, you know what? It may be unkind or it may be unfair, but it goes to show you that unbelievers expect us to live by what we say we believe. If we claim Christ changes hearts today, unbelievers are right to expect our leaders and our teachers to show forth that change in the way we live. And they're right to be disappointed when we fail. And it goes back to what James has been saying all throughout the book. Faith without works is dead. Show me your faith by your works. Amen. And so how do we live our life? And then thirdly, another reason why teaching is scary is because guess what? Teachers talk a lot. <laughs> In Proverbs 10, look at verse 19. It says, In the multitude of the words, there wanted not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. In other words, the more we speak, it says, more than likely you're going to wind up saying something that's going to be sin. In other words, I'll put it to you in today's English, right, or French or whatever you want to call it, the more you talk, the more opportunities you have to put your foot in your mouth. And that's the truth. Anybody remember the eight track? <laughs> right? Uh, I remember when I first started ministry, it was the cassette tape. And then we, we, we graduated to the CDs. Remember those? They're a little thinner. And I remember we would send those tapes out to people who wanted to hear the messages. And they get a stack of, a box of tapes like this or a stack of CD, CDs like this. But now we live in what we call a social media age. How about that? And if you don't know about it, you need to get with it because that's where we're at. Amen. It's everywhere. I hear people say all the time, I don't know how to do this on that computer. Well, that's where we're at. Everything's computerized. Amen. Uh, we saw the problems with that earlier when we had technical difficulties, but that's where we're at. And so as I thought about that, I thought, man, social media, you mean I can take out my phone, put a message on it, and then instantly the whole world can see it. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Not? But it's also pretty scary. That's a lot of power. We're being recorded live right now. It's going to be archived for anybody to go back and listen to it. It's going to be able to reach a lot of people. And that's an amazing thing, but it's also very scary. Amen. There's YouTube. There's Facebook. Now, if I get any of these wrong on people, you can correct me later. Okay. I don't know them all. Amen. Uh, Vimeo and there's uh, devotionals that we can put online. There's so many opportunities for teachers to get the word out is what I'm saying. It is a tremendous blessing because it reaches a much wider audience, but it also means there are more opportunities to say something foolish or an unkind. And so what a tremendous responsibility we have as teachers for God. 
And so we've seen the opportunity for teachers. We've seen the responsibilities of the teacher. And then lastly, we're going to look at the accountability of teachers. Look at James chapter 3 again. Look at the last part of verse 1. James says, my brethren, not many should be teachers. But then look what he says here. Knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation or the stricter judgment. Man, it doesn't sound like James is trying to encourage us to teach, does it? Amen. Really what he's saying is we need to take it seriously. Hybert said this, the comparative adjective greater or stricter implies degrees of treatment at the judgment seat. Whoa. You mean that we as teachers will be held accountable for what we say? Yes. What we say matters a great deal, but what we say for God matters so much more. Amen. Consider the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36. Let's look at this. He says, but I say unto you that every idle or careless word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Now, if Jesus is saying this to everybody, and it applies to everybody, and it does, how much more for those who speak for God? The women and men who stood up and says, I am speaking for God, it applies to us as well. If this statement by Jesus doesn't wake us up, then we're not paying attention. Every message that we give, every sermon that we preach, every class that we teach, every question that we've answered, every email that we sent, every word of counsel that we've given to a young person or a bit of advice that we've given to someone else, even in our personal Christian lives, every casual commitment and comment, every quip or every joke, every critical word, every unkind statement, every caustic question and subtle accusation, every bit of gossip that we've passed along, Every white lie we've told, every evil innuendo, every exaggeration or shouted insult or whispered threat, every foolish word on Facebook or what we call a dumb tweet, all of it and any other words we spoke as Christians on behalf of Christ himself, we will have a give account on, on the day of judgment. What would that be like? Well, James tells us right here, it'll be a stricter judgment. How many of y'all like tax season? I had a family member one time, they got audited, and it just so happened to be right after they got their biggest tax return, go figure. Now, I don't know how the government or IRS figures this out, but every year they select a few that they will audit. And what they do is they come in, and it's like being stripped naked, really, because they go into all your personal records, and they ask so many questions. It's like an interrogation. Now. I know it sounds like I know what I'm talking about. No, I have not been audited, okay? <laughs> but anyway, they ask you all these questions, and they, and they go through all your records. Imagine that. Everything. Uh, they look at your receipts. They want proof for everything that you've claimed on the taxes. They audit you. I thought about that for a moment. And this is what I think James is saying right here in his word. He's saying if you are a teacher of God's word, someday you will be audited by Jesus Christ himself. You can count on that. When I stand up and preach and press the submit button, I'm saying that what I'm teaching is from God's word. And I'll be judged by that. Amen. James wants me to know that someday I'm going to be audited by the Lord for every sermon I've ever preached. I won't be able to hire a lawyer on my behalf. I'll have to stand before the Lord myself to answer for all of it. And there's some questions that I'll have to answer. Here are some of them. Have I been true to the Lord when I'm teaching his word? Have my words been his words? Have I rightly divided the word of truth? I want to show you an example. When Paul bid farewell to the elders of Ephesus, knowing he would never see them again, he said these things in Acts chapter 20 and verse 26. Look what Paul says here. He says, wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And that's a pretty powerful statement. I thought about that for a moment. There is no finer thing that can be said about any preacher than what Paul has just said right here. Look what he says here, folks. 
First of all, what he says here takes a lot of courage. He says, I have not shunned. Do you know there's times where as I'm preparing a message, I'll, I'll, I'll see something in the Word of God. I thought, man, how am I going to preach that? That's a difficult thing, not only for me to preach, but for people to hear. But you know what? God's going to hold me accountable if I don't preach it. Amen? He says, it takes courage. He says, I have not shunned. Think about that. It takes also not only courage, but commitment. He says, declaring unto you. That's a commitment to declare unto others. And it goes on, it takes continual effort. He says here, the whole counsel of God. We talk about our teachers, continual effort, pouring over the scriptures, preparing their lessons for the students. That takes a lot of time and effort, folks. And sometimes we overlook that. But it's a big commitment. And because of this, because Paul preached the whole council, Paul could say, I am innocent of everyone's blood. And I hope one day before, when I stand before the Lord, I can say that before the Savior, that as your pastor, I'm innocent because I preached the whole counsel of God. Amen? And so here we see Paul preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You know, James talked about earlier about not just being hearers of the word, but doers. But the teachers of the hearers will be held at a higher standard. And what they say must be true. You know, I can be sincere all day long, but if I'm not preaching truth, there's a problem. Everything will be judged by God's word. You see, it is easy to take the position of a teacher lightly without considering its cost in terms of accountability. Teachers both must be tested more and judge more strictly. Do you realize the responsibility of the Christian teacher this morning? Do you realize how great the responsibility is? There is no higher calling than to preach and to teach God's word. And God is willed by preaching that the gospel is spread across the earth. When we preach or teach, we join hands with God himself in bringing the word to the world. But high callings also bring high responsibility. Kind of reminds me of Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility, and that is the truth. Let no one take it lightly. God bless all teachers and preachers. Amen? You are doing the work of Jesus. Take it seriously and do it well, and so that you will have no regrets on the day you stand before the Lord. So as we stand to our feet this, this morning, and as we have tried to challenge our teachers this morning. I pray that this was an encouragement to you. I pray that uh, you, every moment you have to share God's word, that you take it to heart, that you're joining hands with God to get the gospel to the whole world. Amen. And, and that's what we do here at Trinity Baptist Church. And so as we stand before the Lord this morning, as we bow our heads in prayer, Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for today. We thank you for your word. What I pray that as we've been challenged by James, that ultimately we're all teachers as Christians. We all have a responsibility to get the gospel to a lost and dying world. Lord Jesus, help us to teach others by our words and our deeds. May the Spirit of Christ fill us so that whoever follows us will become more like you. Our testimony is so important in the society in which we live. Help us, Lord, to recognize the need that when we teach, that it's the most powerful and the most amazing opportunity that we have to make an impact on the world. May we not take it lightly. May we recognize the position as a position of honor, but also a position of great responsibility. Lord, when we stand before you, may we be able to hear the words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And so, Father, as we sing this morning, as you've spoken to hearts, may we dedicate our lives to you in every area. May we realize and recognize, as Paul taught the leaders there in the church, that our testimony matters the most. And people don't care how much we know until they see how much we care. And people don't want to hear us if we're not living for you. Help us to have a great testimony. Help us to live for you, Lord, even this morning as we sing. We thank you.